Cryptocorn plants are such a great addition to any planted aquarium, but have you ever wondered what is the best way to grow these plants so that you can propagate them and have even more for your aquariums? Well, I ran a 190 day experiment growing nearly 200 cryptocorn plants to answer that exact question. In fact, after processing the data from this experiment, we got some statistically significant results that blew my mind and is definitely going to change the way that I grow these plants in the future. So in this video, we're gonna go over everything I learned from running this experiment, including a shocking discovery that I found when I was harvesting some of these plants that is pretty rare and I've never seen before. We used my ebb and flow setup here to run the experiment and we were testing the effects of high light versus low light and a combination of three different types of substrates including gravel, montmorillonite clay and rock wool to see which combination grows these plants the best. So altogether this meant we had six different groups of plants each with a different combination of lighting and substrate. After growing these plants for 190 days I measured the final weight of each plant and counted the number of leaves and number of shoots that were formed on the plants and now we can compare the results between the six different combinations to see which one grows the these cryptocorn plants the best. So total biomass gained is the first metric that we're going to look at and this includes the weight of both the leaves and the roots for each of the plants. I always find it best to look at the heat maps for the high light and low light tubs to see if there's any patterns in the growth of these plants depending on where they're located inside of the tubs. So for example you can see that there were a few plants that grew exceptionally well in this experiment however there is some slightly lower growth happening around the edges of the bin and this effect seems to be more pronounced in the low light setup. So it seems the edges of the bins are not getting as much light and it's having a slight effect on the growth of these plants. So I think this perfectly highlights the need to randomize the location of our plants within these experiments so that we can spread this effect across all six different treatments equally. Looking at the bar graph, we can see that some treatments actually did have better growth than others. So for example, the highlight clay treatment had the highest average total biomass gain. Another really important takeaway here is that the gravel substrate, regardless if it was grown in highlight or low light conditions, actually had the lowest growth across the experiment. And of course, with experiments like this, I like to run stats where I can in order to determine if any of these results are statistically significant and not due to random chance. And what's really cool is that after running an ANOVA, we can see that some of these comparisons did actually turn out to be statistically significant. Now the significance is shown as the letters above each bars, but I personally find this a little bit difficult to read sometimes. So I put together an ANOVA summary matrix to better visually see this laid out. And now we can see which comparisons ended up being statistically significant. This graphic shows all the possible comments from this experiment and all you have to do to read this is look for a square that is green which indicates it's statistically significant and then follow it down to see which two treatments correspond with that square. So for example when we're comparing the highlight clay treatment to the low light gravel treatment we can follow those up to the square that has a p-value of 0.0133 and we can see that that difference was statistically significant. And because we can see in the bar graph that the highlight clay treatment had a higher average total biomass gain compared to the low light gravel we can say with a high degree of certainty that that outcome was the result of the treatments as opposed to random chance. But total biomass gain isn't necessarily the only metric that matters when growing these plants. So let's take a look at the number of leaves gained and see if there are any differences. So based on these heat maps, we see that a lot of the plants that had good growth in terms of biomass also had a large number of leaves that were gained in the experiment. Now this makes sense because these two metrics should be pretty well correlated with one another. When looking at the bar graph, we can see that similarly, the highlight clay treatment had the best growth in terms of number of leaves and that the gravel substrate performed the worst across all six treatments. The only major difference here is that none of the comparisons ended up being statistically significant, which might be due to a high degree of variance or spread of results within each treatment group, which throws off the statistics. With that said, the next metric here is arguably more important, especially if you're interested in propagating and multiplying your cryptocorn plants because it is the number of new shoots that were formed on the plants. And as we know, if your goal is to propagate these plants, you should be growing them in an environment that promotes a lot of new shoots to form. Now these heat maps here are a little bit different and they're very interesting because they illustrate two main things. First, the low light tub really didn't perform very well in terms of promoting new shoots. And second, there is an effect where the edges of the tubs doesn't seem to be promoting a lot of new shoots to form, which probably also corresponds to the area in the tub that gets the least amount of light. And based on these heat maps, it's really not surprising to see that in our bar graphs, we have some major differences across the six different treatments. As you can see, regardless of the substrate used, the highlight treatment grew much more new shoots compared to the low light groups. Out of the substrates 
used clay and rock wool performed the best and they both outperformed the gravel treatments. And out of all of these differences, we do have some statistically significant results, which essentially show that the low light rock wool grew significantly less shoots compared to the highlight clay and the highlight rock wool treatments. Now, cryptocorn plants is not the only aquarium plant species that we used in this experiment. We ran a 100% identical experiment using the same six treatments, but instead we grew them with Anubius plants just like the one I have here. As we know, Anubius is more of an epiphyte plant, meaning it doesn't rely as much on its root structure to drive its growth, whereas cryptocorn plants are a heavy root feeding plant which means that they derive a lot of their nutrients from the substrate that they grow in. And it is really amazing to see that we found some major differences in their optimal growing conditions from running this experiment. So for example, the results from the cryptocorn experiment showed that the highlight condition grew these plants much better in terms of the biomass gained and the number of shoots that were formed. However, the number of leaves was only marginally better than the low light condition. As for substrate, the crypts performed the best when grown in the clay substrate with rock wool coming in second place and the gravel substrate really didn't grow these plants very well. Now in comparison, we found that the Anubius plants also performed the best when they were growing in the highlight condition, however, not in terms of the same metrics. For example, the total biomass gained between the low light and highlight treatments for Anubius really wasn't that different at all but we did see some major differences in terms of the number of leaves and number of shoots that were grown on these plants. The end result of this meant that the Anubius plants grown in high light were more bushy and compact compared to the ones in low light. Now, as for substrate, we really couldn't tell any major differences between the substrates on the growth of the Anubius plants, which might indicate that substrate isn't as much of an important factor for growing Anubius compared to Crips. Now, for me, the highlight of this experiment was actually what I discovered on a few of the plants that I was harvesting. In fact, you can see I have two of the plants that I'm referring to here. I was pretty shocked to see on a select few plants in this experiment, they actually started forming flowers. In fact, out of the 162 plants in this experiment, we only had nine plants develop flowers, which equates to around 5.5% of all the plants grown in this experiment. Now, I have grown many cryptocorn plants in the past, but I have never seen one flower, so this leads me to believe that it must be a pretty rare thing to happen, and that my ebb and flow system here is a pretty good setup for growing these crypt plants. So from all the data that we collected in this experiment, here are a few stats on what we know to get cryptocorn plants to flower. Firstly, out of the nine crypt plants that flowered in this experiment, six were from the low light bin and three were from the high light bin. So despite the highlight bin showing that it grows these plants better, there might be some evidence to suggest that the low light conditions actually induces these plants to flower more frequently. Now in terms of substrates, the clay substrate produced six out of the nine flowers, with gravel producing two and rock wool producing one. So this tells us that out of all of these substrates tested, they were all capable of producing plants that flowered. However, again, it's clear that the clay substrate performed the best in terms of making the plants flower. And lastly, as you can see here, there was a strong correlation between the plants that flowered also being some of the largest plants in this experiment. So to illustrate this, here are the heat maps for total biomass gained, and you can see that some of the largest plants in the experiment were also the ones that ended up developing flowers. If you're curious to learn more about the best techniques for growing aquarium plants, click through to this video here where I run an experiment testing out three different methods for growing aquarium moss. And we actually found that one of the methods grew the plants significantly faster, so you'll be sure to enjoy that one. Thank you for watching, and until next time, take care.